Welcome to the Guiding Principles Part 1 module. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe the nature, use and interaction of the guiding principles and explain the use of the first three guiding principles. Guiding principles can be thought of as the core values or house rules of an organisation. They define the understanding of how it is done here to guide employees at all levels in each of the countless decisions and actions they take. The ITIL guiding principles embody the core messages of ITIL and of service management in general. They are described as being universal and enduring. In other words, they are applicable in all situations and they remain valid regardless of changes in an organization's strategy, goals or management structure. Successfully established, the core principles create the foundation for an organization's culture and behaviours, from strategic decision-making to day-to-day -day operations. Any organization wishing to adopt an ITIL approach should first become familiar with the guiding principles in order to adapt the ITIL guidance to their own specific needs and circumstances. Let's look at each of the guiding principles in turn. Firstly, the guiding principle of focus on value. There is good reason why this principle comes first. Without a focus on value, everything else could simply be wasted effort. Most organisations face a dilemma. Their landscape is one of infinite opportunity, but finite resources. There are countless options an organisation could pursue in order to enhance customer satisfaction, grow the business, enhance the quality of their products and services, or improve the utilisation and performance of their assets. The problem is, most organisations only have a limited amount of money, resource and time to do these things. This means that they have to make choices and prioritise the opportunities they pursue and the actions that they take so that maintaining a focus on value is of paramount importance. None of the other guiding principles will make up for making the wrong choices in the first place. Services are a means of co-creating value and all stakeholder groups, including the service provider, have expectations of value which must be considered and addressed. However, the service provider organisation can only achieve value for as long as there is an organisation willing to consume their service. Therefore, the focus of the guidance in this section is primarily on the creation of value for service consumers although it can and should be adapted to address the needs of all stakeholders. An organisation must ensure that there is value in everything they currently do or propose to do or improve. This means understanding what the value is and who receives it. So, in each situation, the first step when focusing on value is to answer the question, who is the service consumer and who are the key stakeholders? Next, the service provider must understand how the service consumer perceives value, answering questions such as, why does or should the service consumer use the service? What goals does or will it help them achieve? What costs and risks are involved for the consumer? As we saw earlier in the course, value is subject to the perception of the recipient changes over time and can be affected by many factors, but is primarily driven by the achievement of outcomes at optimal cost and risk. Understanding the consumer perspective of value is one of the key challenges facing a service provider. When service provider and service consumer organisations are both part of the same larger organisation, this can be difficult enough despite the organisational ties and the enterprise goals and objectives they have in common. The more distance in the relationship, the greater the challenge becomes. Consider the provider of the language application we used as an example in earlier modules. Their consumers are the millions of individuals around the world who use their application. They have no connection with each other or the service provider other than this. The vast majority will not be geographically close to the service provider's location. They will come from many backgrounds, speak many different languages, and will each have their own personal preferences. But they are a community. 
a community of language learners, and the service provider will need to invest sufficient time and effort to understand the community perspective of value. An important element of value is the experience service consumers have when they interact with the service or the service provider. Although customer experience, or CX, is defined as the entirety of interactions a customer has with an organization and its products, every single interaction has the potential to leave a lasting positive or negative impression on a customer. CX is complex and can be difficult to measure. It can be both objective, for example, the impact of poor or excellent service performance, or subjective, for example, the impact of poor or excellent relationship management. To apply the principle of focus on value, organisations should know how service consumers use each service, encourage a focus on value among all staff, focus on value during normal operation, include focus on value in every step of any improvement initiative. The second guiding principle is Start where you are. A driver pulls up in a city centre and asks a stranger for directions to a local landmark. The stranger looks at him sadly and says, If I was going there, I wouldn't start from here. It's not a great joke, but it does highlight an important concept. To get where you want to be, you need to know where you are. The first step in any improvement initiative is to conduct an assessment of the current state to establish an accurate and reliable baseline from which to proceed. This ensures that the current position is fully understood before committing to a course of action. After all, how will you get to where you want to be if you don't know where you are? Often, there is a discrepancy between perception and reality. Even existing reports or historical data may not show the full picture, and direct observation of the situation should always be considered. Measurements are important, but they should be used in support of observation, not instead of it. In the rush to implement improvements and build something new, there is a risk that existing practices or skills or tools which have value are discarded or lost. This is rarely necessary or wise. The old proverb, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, comes to mind. There are likely to be many elements of the current state which are fit for purpose, as they are and could be used to create the desired future state. Sometimes, of course, it is better to start afresh, retaining nothing from the current state. And sometimes it is not clear-cut and risk assessment will be necessary. Building on existing structures may limit the potential for value realisation, while putting something completely new in place may introduce new risks. The risks on either side will need to be evaluated before deciding on the best course of action. To apply the principle of start where you are, organisations should look at what exists as objectively as possible, determine if existing successful practices or services can be replicated or expanded upon to achieve the desired state. Apply your risk management skills. Recognise that sometimes nothing from the current state can be reused. The third guiding principle is progress iteratively with feedback. Resist the temptation to do everything at once. By organising work into smaller, manageable sections that can be executed and completed in a timely manner, the focus on each effort will be sharper and easier to maintain. IT projects have a troubled history. At the start of the course, we discussed how ITIL emerged at a time when there was a widespread perception in business that IT projects consistently overran, overspent and underdelivered. In fairness, this is probably a reflection of the difficulties associated with large projects in general rather than IT projects per se. The larger the scope of the project and the longer the project timeline, the more difficulty there is in predicting, with accuracy or certainty, the full project costs, risks and benefits. This is because things change, both in the internal and external environments. And the longer the project timeline, the more potential there is for these changes to impact on the project outcomes. And when conditions do change, it can be difficult to respond and change course midway through a large project.
progress iteratively with feedback means, where possible, breaking large initiatives into smaller, more manageable steps. The smaller the step, the more accurately and certainly the costs, risks and benefits can be defined. The completion of each iteration provides the opportunity to take stock. Feedback can be obtained to understand end-user and customer perception of the value created and to identify things that went well or that could be improved going forward. It is also an opportunity to confirm that the steps are still in line with any overarching initiative goals and objectives or changing customer requirements and to make any course adjustments which may be necessary. Smaller steps also provide more opportunity to share and celebrate the successes with stakeholders, maintaining the sense of momentum and enthusiasm that is an important element in project success and which is much harder to maintain in larger projects. To apply the principle of progress iteratively with feedback, organisations should consider the following advice. Comprehend the whole, but do something. Sometimes the biggest challenge to progressing iteratively is the desire to understand and account for everything, resulting in what is sometimes called analysis paralysis. This must be avoided. Internal and external environments are constantly changing, so feedback is essential. Fast does not mean incomplete. Each iteration should be complete within itself.